very good morning to you, church. Uh, thank you, my dear friend, Pastor Gary, for that. Uh, I'm trying to reschedule the time, okay? It's adamant that it won't, okay. Uh, Pastor Gary is a dear friend uh, and also full of wisdom of God. And I'm not giving a lip service to him. Whenever we've been together, there are gems coming from the scripture through his heart. He's a blessing. He's an encourager. But when he says warm mountain welcome, I would suggest I disagree with him because yesterday my wife, who's sadly not feeling very well, and he's, she's gutted, she's back uh, in the chalet. And uh, Gary met us last night and said, be aware of mountain bears as well. And of course, my wife panicked. And uh, he says, he, Pastor Gary, who is giving a warm mountain welcome, says, hugged Maggie, says, don't worry. Are you a good runner, fast runner? She said, yes. He says, run faster than your husband. So <laughs> I have been meditating on that instead of the word of God. <laughs> what does it mean? And uh, this is mountain friendship. Uh, I have titled the message today, Distressing Time, and I cannot elaborate further on on how distressing time is. About, I would say, six weeks ago, after a culmination of many emails back and forth from a gentleman in Ukraine who is a missionary from South Africa in Ukraine, he wanted to meet with us. And uh, so six weeks ago, finally, we met each other. And I was wondering why a missionary from U South Africa to U Ukraine who spent about 20 years of his life there so is desperately insisting to me to, to, to ministry, the Iranian ministry. And we spoke together. And I said, uh, I will just withhold his name because of his security. He is a 19-year-old boy. He, is a 20, he has a 21-year-old boy. And he was concerned because the drumbeats of war six, seven weeks ago were already being audible. He says, I don't know. We are South African, but they might be enlisted into the war, and we have lost contact. Uh, so I said, what do you want? Why do you want us to uh, connect together? He says, I want to represent you in Ukraine. I said, why for? He says, the church in Ukraine needs to know about persecution. The Ukrainian church is very jealous and zealous about ministry to the Muslim world. And they have sent out many missionaries all across the world, particularly to the Islamic countries. And imagine, as we're speaking, we never had a clue, as prophetic as we are and we claim to be, that in about two or three weeks, this is what will happen in Ukraine. 3.2 million are out of the country. And we didn't have a clue how distressing the time would be. I'm coming from Iran. I was born and bred there, so was my wife, Maggie. Our four daughters, three of them were born in Iran. So we immigrated out of the country to a prophetic word after the eight-year Iran-Iraq war, which lasted eight years, and over a million people were killed and injured fatally, life-threatening injuries. A futeless, absolutely stupid war. All wars are stupid. It's egocentric wars, and now the war in Ukraine is egocentric as well, without any purpose. But the Iran-Iraq war is said to be one of the most catastrophic, idiotic wars which wiped away the economy of both Iraq and Iran, irrecoverable almost. And uh, after the war ended, we felt God telling us to come out of the country. You know, God has his own ways. Everybody was running away during the eight-year Iran-Iraq war. We stayed there, and people were saying, you have the means to get out because we had an engineering company and uh, dealing with Switzerland. You can't go. Why are you staying? You know, safety is where God wants you to be. <laughs> Safety is not what people perceive safety is. So after the war ended, everybody started coming back, especially all those, all those able businessmen. And then God says, now it's time to go. <laughs> and we didn't have a clue what to do. So we came out to Switzerland and down to England, and then we felt God telling us to prepare an army to go back to Iran. You know, Iran is a wonderful and beautiful and hospitable nation. Forget about what you see in the media. There are about 3 or 4% of the Islamic junta and 
rulers who are ruling the country, but people are suffering as people in Ukraine are suffering now, as people in Russia are suffering now. You need just a handful of people with the guns and the buttons on the power, and th that is the story of Iran as well. But uh, in the last 160, 70 years of evangelism into Iran and mission activities, uh, you know, Iranian, Iranian uh, people moving from the Dark Ages almost to the avant-garde nation, uh, building hospitals and schools, are indebted to the missionary activities, from Christian Missionary Society of UK to the Presbyterian and Mission Board of United States, Lutheran Mission Board of uh, Germany. They came to Iran, built schools and hospitals in every major city, Tehran, Tabriz, Kermanshah, Mashhad, everywhere you go. And everywhere you go in Iran, you cannot avoid to see in the tombstone of missionaries who came to Iran, served all their lives, died there without seeing a result. That, I call you, is a sacrifice. I met some of these missionaries before they fled after the Iranian revolution or expelled. I have to correct my words. They were not, they didn't flee. They had, they were expelled from Iran. They built schools, hospitals, universities, colleges. So the Iranians owe to them. But you see, they worked hard and they didn't see any result. Does that resonate with you? Sometimes, as a minister, as a businessman, as a, as a parent, you work hard and you don't see the result that you want to see. And maybe, all in all, the statistics indicate about 300 Muslims, Iranians, over 160 plus years of mission activity. Even the hospital staff didn't become Christians. There were about 300 believers. But now, after 43 years of Islamic revolution of Iran, all statistics, the conservative one says over a million, hundred thousand Iranians have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Iran is coined as fastest growing church in the world. So I'm honored to be a partner. And thank you, Pastor Gary, for your friendship. And I'll ignore the bear hunt part, you know, the, that is not important. When we are saying in a distressing time, Something resonated in my heart as I was preparing to share today in this wonderful Sunday, approaching Easter Sunday from Ephesians 5, 16 and 17. It says, look therefore carefully how you will walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Because there are two types of walking the writer of the epistle of Ephesians is talking about. A wise walking, and walking means living. Walking means acting, and as believers... So this is a journey of life. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. <laughs> Therefore, be ye not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, the writer of Ephesians, Paul the Apostle, is writing 2,000 years ago, the days are evil, but the days have always been evil. Look at Cain and Abel. The days have been always evil. Look at the history of the Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. We see evil all the time. But the days are evil now. And God is inviting us to be wise and redeem the time. The Farsi word, vachtra dariabid, it means arrest the time. Uh, time, have you noticed, has got an attitude of escaping. It's morning and you have all the plans and it's night and you said, I didn't accomplish what I wanted to do. What did I do with my day? Does it resonate with your heart? Time escapes, time is run fast. Maybe it's because of my age, you know, we get older and time runs fast, but time is running fast and you need to arrest it. So I took a few lessons from the Old Testament, from the life of an amazing prophet, which I have really taught about him and become, become almost his mate and will be friends and maybe neighbors in heaven. His name is God is Salvation. In Hebrew, it's Elisha, Elisha the prophet. So if you read 2 Kings, it starts with 2 Kings, second chapter. Elijah the prophet is now going to be taken away, and Elisha is coming on the seat, and the times are distressing. <laughs> distressing for Israel, distressing for the Hebrew nation. Very distressing because, you know, Jezebel, uh, son of, daughter of Beth Baal, or servant of Baal, Jezebel, the queen, is ruling. It was Ahab the king, but really Jezebel was running the show. Now, there are so many lessons I've taken from this one or two chapters of 2 Kings chapter 2. And one of them is, just before that, in 1 Kings chapter 18, 19, a gentleman called Obadiah comes on the scene. Anybody remembers Obadiah? 
Now, in heaven, many of you have plans to meet certain people, and I've heard many people, when I meet, I go and meet Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm going to meet Daniel. How did he manage to do what he did and became the prime minister of the biggest, you know, <laughs> biggest country in the world at that time? He became really a, a prime minister of uh, Cyrus, the king of Iran. And uh, somebody says, I would love to meet Paul. You know, how he did he manage to invade and capture the world, you know, for Christ? Uh, you know, and some people say, I want to meet Elisha or Elijah. I want to meet Obadiah. You know why? I want to say how a godly man like Obadiah survived serving as a chief of staff of an evil queen, Jezebel. How do you do that? Because when he met Elijah, he says, I'm a God-fearing man. Do you remember that? Obadiah is a servant of God. He served in the court of evil queen Jezebel, and he hid 50 prophets at a time in two caves, 50 in each cave. He hid the prophets. Now, we have an attitude that we retreat from the places of power and authority, which is darkness is prevailing, and then we say, oh, it's dark out there, but we retreat from there. We, we need to have governors, we need to have surgeons, we need to have MPs, we need to have people in authority in dark places like Obadiah, <laughs> because they can come to our help when we need it. The church is not very familiar in godly governance, and I will underline that. Anytime the church has come with great power and authority and influence, corruption has come in, because we don't have the Daniel attitude of not being corrupted. You know, just being a friend or acquaintance of a prophet doesn't make you a prophet. Look at Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. He spent his life with the prophet, and at the end, if you lift his sleeves, there is leprosy. Staying and spending time with a godly person doesn't necessarily mean that we become godly. Even staying close to Jesus I was just telling Pastor Gary, I have created, coined this term, conference hoppers. We, I don't know whether you have it here in UK, in United States, but in Iran, we have conference hoppers. From one conference to another conference. From one conference to another conference. They think the more they spend closer to the pulpit, the more holy and strong they will come. But you know, strength comes from spending personally alone with the King of Kings, Jesus. So Obadiah was a servant of God. One thing which <laughs> touches my heart is he hid these prophets, 50 of them at a time. I have called them hidden prophets or hiding prophets. You know, in heaven, we will know each other. We'll remember today, this Sunday. We'll remember all the stories we have shared because we'll not lose our minds. We'll have a glorious new body God will give you. Are you happy with that? Because as soon as I said you will have a glorious body, and I saw some people looking at me, what's wrong with my body now? Now, I know what's wrong with my body when I stand next to Brother Gary. I'm very short. I'm like a dwarf. <laughs> you know, I like, I like a kind of couple of, not two, three feet, just a feet higher. Would you agree with that? Now, I would be, like to be a leaner and a bit more hair and all that. If you fly with me to Istanbul and fly out of Istanbul, there are many English folks who come to Istanbul and they plant hair and they come back. Many of them have a patch on their head. I don't have that money to spend that time and effort to patch. But you know, in heaven we'll have a glorious body, but we'll remember everything. I don't want to be remembered as a hiding prophet. It will not be fun. Who's this gentleman? He's one of the hiding prophets. Now this is what happened when you're hiding, and I want to attract your attention with all this long introduction. When Elisha was going to be taken to heaven, they came to Gilgal. Let's read from the word of God. It will be better to give you an understanding of the situation. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, 2 Kings chapter 2. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. 
And the sons of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take you, your master, from over you? And he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. In other words, shut up. I know. You come down. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were in Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the, today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep quiet. So this is the second group. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of prophets also went and stood at a, some distance from them as they both were standing by Jordan. Fifty of them stood at a distance. Now, I cannot corroborate these fifty, whether they were the hiding prophets who had come out of the cave or not. But I just want to quickly bring to your attention, and I would appreciate wonderful saints here in this beautiful sanctuary, and also those who are listening to live streaming now, or you will listen to this message later on. Meditate on this. And I just don't want to kind of be criticizing. This is more exhortational. I am wondering, and it's not also judgmental to these prophets, but how on earth they had all this knowledge, but they didn't do anything about it. They knew a lot of information. I mean, they were sons of prophets. Gilgal and Bethel, there were two seats of prophetic schools. Elijah, the prophet, had started when you study in detail about the stories. So they were coming from prophetic schools. They knew that Elijah was going to be taken to heaven, but they stood from a distance and watched. You know, when you're hiding, it brings a sense of paralysis. You accumulate information and wisdom from the scripture without the power and authority to exercise it. Shall I repeat myself? When you remain too long hiding, conference hopping, you learn a lot of wisdom from the scripture because this is a book of wisdom. It's a book that will captivate your heart and soul. And I'm addressing the believers who are hearing this program. But be aware of this. Not taking the step out of the boat, not to engage out, it will mean you have a lot of knowledge you will know when Elijah is going to take him away, but you will stand from a distance and watch. I don't want to stand from a distance and watch. I was in, in our center in Armenia, which I hope uh, Pastor Gary and friends will come end of this year, hopefully, and we'll have a training program. It's a wonderful center near Mount Ararat. I mean... There was a lot of noise. The, the sanctuary takes about 400 maximum. There, I don't know. There were hundreds more. There was a lot of noise. And we had in the front hundreds of people. 70% of the congregation were there. There was so much noise. Demons were being cast out. People were being released. There was so much noise. Children were everywhere. So I said, please, I beg you children and young people from the church, go back and stand back there so that we can ah, have some air here. And two of the kids looked at me and said, Pastor, action is here, not there. It stayed with me. Action is when you step out of your comfort zone. You know, in Iran, the church is being persecuted. And I have coined this term, internalization. I looked the word internalization. It's a, it's a, it's a business term. When you want to share sell shares in a company, and you don't make it public auction. It's, internal, it's not insider trading, but you keep it internally. But also internalization means you internalize your values and your knowledge. You know, in Iran, many times when pastors have been arrested, Muslim converts, and by the way, they said the church in Iran, how is it behaving with Muslim converts? Are they accepting them? The whole church is Muslim convert in Iran. Many times the Muslim judges will say, I am sending you Hassan or Ali or Fatima. Shut up and don't speak about it. Keep it to yourself. Look at this. Keep it to yourself. 
You're a Christian. We are releasing you after two years of solitary confinement. I can tell you story after story. Internalize. Don't share. Persecution starts when you externalize the gospel. Would you agree to this? I don't know what is the habit of this wonderful church. When you agree with someone preaching, would you say amen or would you shake your head? You know, in some cultures, when they do this, it doesn't mean agreement, it's disagreement. I, I have found this, you know, it's very funny. And they do this, you know, it means agreement. So, are you, do you have a habit of saying amen if you like? You know, you can say, just for my encouragement, not your encouragement. If you ex- internalize, you will be hiding safely in a cave, but you will be a hidden prophet. When you externalize, you might suffer ridicule and persecution. In the Word of God in 2 Timothy, it says, everyone, everyone, and I checked the word, everyone, all who live a godly life will suffer persecution. You in this wonderful highland, high mountain community, once you decide to work, share with your workmates, you will suffer. When you decide to stand up for righteousness, you will suffer. When you start praying, you will suffer. When you are a school teacher or headmaster or headmistress, you start Defending the morality of the law, you will suffer and you will be ridiculed. Not only in the United States, all over the world is the same. But I'm afraid of being called a hidden prophet. I don't want to hide. Look at what happened later on. And I have to be very quick. Second King chapter 2, verse 15. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said... The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught up with him and cast him upon some mountains. And they sent, therefore, 50 men. Again, I cannot corroborate, but is it possible that there were these hidden prophets, 50 of them, who went after a wild goose chase and I just want to caution you be aware of some wonderful godly people who will send you after wild goose chase you want to go to a mission field a very well wishing friend will say is it safe is it safe to go to Iran now is it safe to go to Ukraine now is it safe to go to Turkey now every time we are making an effort to do something for God For the last 60 years in my life, is it safe, Lazarus? It's not safe, brother and sister. Safe is to do God's will in your life. And if it's not safe, who cares? I don't want to be called a safe, hidden prophet in a cave. So Elisha gave up. He sent the 50 people. They went in a futile exercise. They came back. But look what happened here. Immediately, the first miracle. Verse 19, now the men of the city said to Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. Now, my thought is, these 50 prophets, these godly people who knew the intention of God, they could touch God's heart. They knew the secrets of God. They knew Elijah is going to be taken away by a fiery chariot. They didn't do anything about unfruitfulness of the land. You know why? Because they were hiding in a cave. People are suffering out there. People are suffering here. People are suffering in this beautiful nation. People are suffering in the overseas. It is very dangerous to internalize the gospel. Let's come out of our hiding places. And I want to close with this encouraging note. We are approaching Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is about this. One person, Jesus Christ, did not internalize his holiness to heaven. He externalized it and came down, made a mess of his life, was crucified, unjustly spat upon, Killed, buried, resurrected, so that I can stand here today and speak and say, Jesus is alive today. Jesus is living today. Jesus is saving today. Jesus is healing today. Hallelujah. And for all of you who are listeners, 
You have a time to meditate, kneel down and say, God, I don't want to be hiding prophet or prophetess. Now, I want to encourage with this last word. And do you remember about this charismatic last word? Have you heard charismatic preachers saying, this is my last word? And they have about eight last words. So, this is my last word, one of the eight. Whatever you have brought today, Jesus will multiply it. Don't hide it in your pocket. The enemy has an attitude of pressing us done and saying, you have only two fish and five loaves. Don't make a stupid move. You cannot fit 10,000. You know a little bit of the culture of Turkey. Don't make a mess. Don't go to Turkey. You know nothing about Armenia. You don't. Iran is in danger. Ukraine is in danger. Poland is in danger. Why are you going out? You don't have the... You don't have much money, always putting us down. Keep your two fish and five loaves in your pocket. Could you check your pockets? What do you have? Buckets of your heart, what do you have? If you have a little bit of anointing, bring it today. Let Jesus multiply. Amen? You have a bit of resources, financial, bring it today. Jesus will multiply it. And I want to tell you a story about Turkey. Next time. Pastor, you are in Turkey. Before we go to training, I would really ask you to spend a day in Taksim Square, the biggest square in Istanbul. And I want you to see, to corroborate the story I'm telling you. And I would encourage any one of you to come to Istanbul. Within about half an hour, you will see some American blonde. You will know that there are Americans, there are blonde, blue-eyed young people. And they speak fluent Farsi. You'll approach them and ask the question, where are you from America, from Alabama, from Wisconsin, from this place and that place? Are you a Christian? Yes. We are Mormons. They're preaching Mormonism. Then you'll meet some Irish, especially the Dutch and also Swedish. They speak Farsi. Who are you? They are Jehovah Witnesses. You'll also see some other Americans they're non-Trinitarian Christians with so much money, I don't know where they bring it. Three groups are stealing and destroying the harvest while the prophets are hiding. Where are the graduates from seminaries in the United States? Why are we hiding? Why are we accumulating? And don't misunderstand, I'm not against Bible colleges. We have an online Bible college. We are communicating with Pastor Gary to how to enhance it, make it better. I'm not against acquiring. I'm not ex against meditating, and pondering, and sitting down for days and days, feeding our souls from the Word of God. But if we keep on pondering and meditating and praying without taking an action, we'll be also blamed as hidden prophets. So step out. In stepping out, you see God's glory. In stepping out, all this knowledge will be put in action. And how would you know God will not bless you and anoint you and empower you Are you moving on? Anyone volunteer to step out from the cave? The cave is a safety, but it's a man-made, Obadiah-made safety. It's not God-made safety. I would rather live one day like Elijah, facing Ahab and Jezebel, Slaughtering 450 unjust, evil prophets. Now, we do it in spirit. And not live a hundred long years hiding in a cave. Shall we bow our heads and pray? No matter where you are in your spiritual walk and journey. Approaching Easter Sunday is not meditating on what Jesus did on the cross is meditating on what you can do carrying your cross. Without the cross, there is no resurrection. Without carrying your cross, there won't be a resurrection power engulfing your heart and soul, aflaming you and your neighborhood. So let's come out of our shells and our safety nets. Share with our neighbor. You have been putting God off for a long time. Pastor Gary says, bring your friends and enemies. That resonated with my heart. This is a good opportunity to make fun of yourself. Go and knock on the door of an unruly neighbor and say, listen, 
you're not going along with me, but I just want to tell you and beg you and urge you, please come this Sunday to the church. There is something happening. And I'll be blamed for eternity if I don't share it with you. <laughs> Go with a smiling face. I'm not saying provoke unjustly persecution to yourself, but I'm saying don't create a patronizing unnecessary safety net. So I pray for you, church, here and everyone listening to this message. We have got the power of resurrection within us. We have got the flame of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But people need to see because the land is fruitless in Jericho. And we need to go like a salt, be dissolved amongst these nations so that we create fruitfulness for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.